The Carboniferous period is usually well known for the invasion and diversification of land tetrapods, the giant arthropods which flourished in the oxygen-rich atmosphere, or even the extensive plant life which created enormous deposits of energy-rich coal. But little attention is often paid to the inhabitants of the sea. Besides the now famous buzzsaw shark, Helicoprion, many other bizarre water dwellers patrolled the seas over the course of this period of time. One such critter was the sword-faced buzzsaw shark, Ornithoprion. Welcome to my very own take on Shark Week. Discovery Channel's yearly breadwinner has gone progressively downhill in quality over the years, with the fan-favorite example of the horrendous mockumentary which tried to suggest Carcaracles Megalodon is still alive using doctored photographs. I will be doing something completely different to that sorry excuse for education, entertainment, or edutainment. This week will be chock full of sharky goodness, as well as some programs surrounding the little known fish, which vary in the degree of how closely related they are to true sharks. So without further ado, Ornithoprion. At some point in the late 1950s, nine fish fossils were found in a few layers of shale, in two separate outcrops in Indiana. One of these specimens, taken from a site called Logan Quarry, was excavated manually and split down the middle. Shale is incredibly fine-grained sedimentary rock, made out of super-eroded, super-weathered particles of quartz and calcite and the like. Once this is laid down on a surface, it becomes a rock over millions of years. Because of the amount of carbon and the size of the particles which usually get mixed in with this type of rock, it becomes super thin and laminated. Laminated just means it has a ton of super thin layers. Fossils preserved in this type of rock often get fossilized in two dimensions, either on their side or belly. The fossil fish from Indiana were only visible from the outcrop as blobs of shale, since the fossils themselves were encased in the rock. Since the rock was a super hard, chemically resistant, carbonaceous shale, the researchers who found most of the specimens had to get creative with how to actually see what they were working with. The one split fossil gave a good starting point on what exactly might be in the blobs and how to get a better look without breaking them. The fossils which stuck to either slabs preserved extremely small details, down to the micron scale. That would be nearly impossible for a fossil preparator to manually prepare without damage, especially in the 1960s when this discovery occurred. I wonder with how good our tech is now, maybe we could do this with the help of a big microscope? So, what did they use to see the preserved soft tissues, cartilage, scales, and bones? X-ray radiography. Since CT scanning tech didn't exist or exist in the same way as it does today, X-rays were the only option. What the researchers found once they X-rayed the specimens was quite unusual. The bones preserved were mostly skulls of a type of cartilaginous fish of the Holocephali subclass. These fish aren't technically sharks, but close relatives in the same way as stingrays and mantas. I've included this critter in Shark Week because its relative, Helicoprion, is often called a shark, and probably looked a little like a shark, so I thought it'd fit in too. Since x-rays aren't usually used for seeing into fossils, and since they aren't great and had bad resolution at the time, the images produced of what rested within the shale blobs are of poor quality. That being said, they were still useful in giving a general idea of what the bones looked like. And from there, diagrams could be estimated of what's going on within the stone. Most of the specimens preserved skulls. Most of the specimens also preserved evidence of feeding traces. Each specimen had some kind of mangling going on prior to fossilization, with many decapitated from their bodies. The severed pieces of the sharks settled to the bottom and were quickly covered in a fine sediment. Aerobic decomposition was followed by anaerobic decomposition, enough to deflesh most of the bones, but not enough to destroy the cartilage. Many of the cartilage elements have decayed away though, leaving spaces between the calcified bone where they once were. One specimen did preserve some of the skeleton, and another a nearly intact skull. Altogether, the fossils present a shark-like fish with a long pointed skull. 
The lower jaw was much longer than the upper, and embedded in the middle was a whorl of teeth, the buzzsaw mechanism characteristic of this group of fish. The upper jaw had some low-crowned bar-shaped teeth, which looked like brass knuckles or molars of some kind. The rest of the upper jaw apparently also had some kind of tooth whorl, but the text on that was a little confusing. The lower jaw also has shock-resistant bony reinforcements at the back end, where it attached to the skull. The critter was named Ornithoprion, which means bird saw. Since the eye sockets were so large, they made the skull look almost like a bird's skull. I get where the descriptors were coming from, but I don't think bird saw should have been wasted on a fish. The entire body is not known, but a good portion of the front half is. They probably had about five pairs of gill arches, a long body, and strong front fins. Renowned paleoartist Yoshiwa Knup has reconstructed the beast with a body more like a frilled shark or a goblin shark. Despite the bizarre anatomy and seemingly ferocious appearance, these critters were pipsqueaks. The skulls measured around 4 inches or 10 centimeters. That would mean the rest of the body would probably be pretty small too. It's a member of the Eugeniodontida order, which also belongs to that holocephali group I mentioned earlier. The holocephali used to be much more common, with members converging on the shark body and ecology, like Stethacanthus and Falcatus, while others took on adaptations which made them look more like a sci-fi concept for a living spaceship yet more adapted for reefs and tropical waters of the Carboniferous and Permian periods, with bizarre crinkle-cut french fry shapes with all the frills and trimmings, like this fine fella, Balancia. The group which Ornithoprion belonged to was a lot closer in shape and sometimes ecology to the only living group, the ratfishes. What it used its super long mouth sword for is the big unknown. It could have used it like the modern swordfish and stabbed its prey, or it could have trawled along the ocean bottom to stir up any tasty treats. There are actually other fish which have convergently evolved a similarly disproportionate lower jaw. Sorodon and Sorocephalus of the Cretaceous Western Interior Seaway and the modern half-beaks of the Hemiramphidae. What these other fish use their sword jaws for is also kind of mysterious. The sword jaws of the Cretaceous fish are much shorter than our Ornithoprion buddy, and perhaps even more reinforced, enough to make some researchers think they used it for ramming and fighting. I don't think we could say the same for Ornithoprion's sword. Bottom feeding can be ruled out for the bird saw because bottom feeders usually have their mouths situated on the bottom of their heads, facing the seafloor. The teeth of Ornithoprion are the type usually used for crushing hard prey like shelled mollusks and armored arthropods, so the sediment stirring face sword makes the most sense so far. These specimens presumably still exist locked away in storage, since the paper which described them was published in the Field Museum's journal. I bet the Ornithoprion fossils still reside there. Someone ought to get on CT scanning these fossils, since I bet a lot more detail could be observed now that we have better tech. Now that we've gone over one of the least known non-shark sharks, my shark week might take a turn for something more familiar. Stay tuned. Subscribe to consume some delicious contento. Gore the like button, scratch out a comment, and jostle the notification bell just so you're in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching. A very special thanks to my patrons Andy Volano, Rob Biondolilo, Ed Pretz, Pretzi Pizzara, Dinosaur, Natty Cat, and Dana Manchester. If you'd like to support my channel and receive some extra content, pledge to my patron at any tier you want. Next level.